Hello, good afternoon everybody. My name is Mike and this is sky surfing. So sky surfing is one of the most inspirational sports of our generation within skydiving. It's been performed since 1992 and it's really signified by high g-force spins, twists and rolls through many axes. Riding skyboards is very, very difficult. Only a few people do it in the world still now. And I was part of the team, and I was very fortunate to be part of the team that represented Great Britain. The sport has been dominated by a number of teams. This is one in particular. So this is Rob Harris and Joe Jennings on camera. Joe has very kindly led us to use the footage of Rob. This was shot over 20 years ago. And he's the X champion. This footage appealed to a global audience. We went out to over 170 countries in 21 languages to like 100 million people during the time. The athletes, this is another one, Sean McCormack, still surfing now, part of Red Bull Air Force, 30,000 jumps. This is some footage recently shot by the same camera fire. Beautifully framed, shot in 4K. You can see some great moves here. <laughs> Safety is paramount when you come to sky surf. What's very, very important is that we maintain that. It's very hard on the body. When you're spinning at four revolutions a second, it really can hurt. Mud is pulling your hands and your arms. And it's a progression like every other part of the sport. You start at the level and you build up. So a little bit about the history. The French pioneered the sport and we stand on their shoulders. The likes of Eric Fraudé won the X Games at 40 years old when it was last run. Patrick, just the godfather of the sport. Philly, he actually uh, named the sport. We learned from them. This is the very first television commercial that featured a former sky Back Always keep plenty of Coca-Cola Classic on ice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've been really fortunate to have the, the people that participated in sky surfing help us out here. So we've got people from sponsors to competitors to the people that actually organised the tour stops and the ESPN events. So Troy Hartman, Troy was champion sky surfer, X Games, 96 I think he actually won it. And he's going to give us some of his thoughts on what it's like to sky surf and participate. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Troy Hartman and I used to be a competitive sky surfer. Uh, my time was in the 90s when the sport was uh, really at its biggest. Uh, I started in 91. Uh, I did a tandem and uh, the same day I did my tandem skydive, uh, somebody at the drop zone uh, had this videotape of a guy in France doing a Planet Reebok commercial and of course his name was Patrick de Gaillardon. Um, I landed from my first jump and was just on top of the world and then I see this video and it's like oh my god I'm going to do that, <laughs> probably because I was so wound up from having just done my first skydive. I, I was, you know, Superman. I could do anything. And I saw this guy uh, jumping out of a plane with, his, with a board on his feet. It was, it was in excess, suicide blonde. I'll never forget, never forget, because I got a copy of that videotape uh, and I watched it. Oh, geez, I watched that tape two, three hundred times. Uh, because I knew someday I was going to be a sky surfer and it was about four years later 
that I, I actually finally got the chance to do it. It was starting to grow as a sport. There were a handful of guys in Europe doing it, guys and girls, I think, back then. Uh, and there were two or three guys here in the States. It was Rob Harris, Bob Greiner, and uh, Jerry Loftus. Jerry Loftus made the first uh, sky surfboard, Surflight. Uh, so he was instrumental in really getting the, the sport to take off because uh, uh, no one had boards. Um, we were building them out of you know plywood in the very beginning, but then finally we had these real boards that were lightweight and they could perform. Um, and the Americans, uh, we started to do pretty well. You know, we it, the sport started in Europe; they had an advantage. Um, and then you know, with Rob Harris, uh, you know, Rob Harris really was the one who. Um, who led us. Uh, he, he, Rob Harris was the best sky surfer of all time. I don't think anybody ever would have beaten him. Um, he, was, he was a true inspiration and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to learn to sky surf at the same drop zone, uh, Taft in California. Uh, so I was lucky enough to train right next to Rob and uh, that, really, uh, that really helped my progression to pick up the sport quickly. Um, I was competing within three years uh, my years of competition were 94 to 98, uh, and with my partner Vic Papadato, we managed to win the X Games. Um, so we had a really great run. Uh, it was it, we, the timing was great. The sport, I was just dedicated dedicated to it, 100%. Uh, that's all I wanted to do. Uh, I spent every dime I had on the sport. I was in college and um, would go every weekend and. You know, obviously my friends, family, they all thought I was a lunatic, but I knew. I said, this is what I'm going to do. It was just, it was just too amazing. Um, it, it was scary, uh, and it was frustrating. It was very hard. Uh, it was not an easy sport to learn, and I had to battle, uh, you know, uphill for many jumps. I would say it took 500 jumps probably before I felt like I was not going to lose control of the board and have to cut it away. Uh, really, it, it takes a long time to get to the point where you feel like you're in charge of the board and it's not in charge of you. Okay, that's perfect from him. To have a world champion actually give us his, his, his input is just fantastic. And there's a bit more of that from him to come. Um, okay, so the sport was born in uh, 1991. I started in 1992. I saw the same commercial as Troy over this side of the ponds. And um, progression was really, really hard at that point uh, because we were making our own boards and they were going wrong. And they go wrong really, really fast. So I, I had a board that was cut for me. The tail section was cut into a really nice, sharp point like that. Got out the aircraft, spun so hard, and uh, tried it a second time and um, broke my ankle. Broke my ankle. And um, that, was, that was a really, really bad day. But carried on jumping, strapped it up, carried on jumping, uh, went back to the smaller board again, um, got my confidence back, made a new board just after that, this kind of size, the mid-size board, and went for it again, but nobody knew. So as nobody knew, you've just got to keep on trying to evolve the sport. Um, Robin, freestyle champion. A lot of people came from a freestyle background. I was the same. Um, Olaf was on his way to invent free fly and he was sky surfing as well back then. Great stories. Um, world champions, X Games champions were all born here. Oliver, Stefan, he was his protege. Valeri, great friend of Valeri, um, immortalized and he went on to do fantastic stuff in wingsuits and forever staying young as well. Um, Patrick and Rob. But everybody was having fun. This is the key thing, everybody was having fun. There was lots of surfing over lots of blue skies and lots of blue seas. People were surfing together um, on their boards. Patrick didn't know when to stop. He took Wendy Smith up. That was crazy. This I do not understand. <laughs> Three people on the board, it went wrong. So, back then, cameras were really clunky and um, compared to modern day cameras, they were really rubbish. And the thing back then was to custom, custom fit your, your camera helmets. So you went to Wes. And that's how you custom fit helmets in the land. The, the cameras were state of the art back then, high eight. 
<laughs> Two of them, plus a stills, that was heavy. So that continued, people got newer kit, just more fancy. Three cameras on Ford's helmet there, great setup from Bonehead. Uh, the VX1000 three-chip camera. Adrian, Adrian, we had to buy him the biggest flash we could find. Um, he had this shot in his mind that he wanted to actually um, to get, and we went and got it. He used to flip his camera upside down. This is, this is the, the red camera that Joe's using. It's epic, but it produced awesome footage. And um, when we were at the X Games and the Pro Tour, we even had um, the, the, the live edge ground systems that they were wearing on top of three cameras. So 101 on the equipment, um, of course we've got a rig. Um, some key points if you're thinking about sky surfing, get some advice. There are people still about. Um, I give advice for free, I coach for free, it's all fine. We just wanna see people do it really well and safely. Um, I think that the main, the main thing for me is when, when, when you start with the sky surf, you've got your rig, you disconnect your RSL because that's only going to cause more problems. I'm not sure about mods nowadays. Um, I'd take advice on that. If anybody's got a bit of kit, I don't have one. Uh, certainly my Cypress, I set my Cypress a little bit higher for it. Um, BOC, um, I used to have a leg strap throw away the, the, the early days, and then you get a horseshoe malfunction, and that doesn't come out well, um, especially with the board. Um, I always recommend, people always say to me, they want to go surfing and they want to wear a pair of jeans because they see people wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And that's great until you have to cut the board away. Um, I would always recommend a suit that's a little more baggy on the top, trousers that are a little bit tighter. Um, it may not look cool anymore, but it saves you going hunting for the board in the forest. Um, and the board themselves, we start with a small board. Go to a mid-sized board once you're competent on that and uh, we'd go into that in the full briefings. And then once you're really competent, you can really upset people in the aircraft with the bigger boards. <laughs> and um, you know, in a pack that really gets tight in a Cessna, man, it really is a challenge. And people have been very kind and generous because they know that you're doing something pretty dangerous and they let you gear up in a, in a certain way. I won't go into any more of the equipment really, um, but what's really important is teamwork and training. Um, but yeah, I had some scary moments in the sport for sure, uh, especially in the first 500 jumps. Uh, you really don't feel like you're in control of the board for those first few hundred jumps. You feel like you're just going along for the ride and you're trying to get stable and uh, for at pull time. <laughs> That's really your goal when you go out the, do the door in those early uh, stages. Uh, you're, you're going out the door saying, well, I'm going to try to learn a few things but what's most important is that I get back up on the board by you know 6,000 feet <laughs> and that's number one goal and it's a it's a big deal it's a, it's it's on your mind the whole time uh, only after about 500 jumps or so do you start to feel comfortable enough that you're um, you're not worried the whole time about whether you're gonna lose control of the board and you're focusing more on fine-tuning and um, you know, the, the moves are hard. They're extremely difficult uh, moves to, you know, to conquer. And, and s some particular moves took two or three hundred jumps uh, just dedicated, um, such as hanging upside down and, and doing a helicopter. Uh, I would say for most sky surfers, that's, um, that was one of the hardest things to master. Uh, I know I spent hundreds and hundreds of jumps just learning how to hang upside down under the board. Um, it was really hard and uh, doing a perfectly straight helicopter, I, 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 that was always challenging for me. That was definitely something that didn't come easy to me. And even in, even in competition, in, in you know, my last years of competition, when I had thousands of uh, sky surf jumps, uh, doing the helicopter was, was probably, for me, the, still the most challenging maneuver. It was never a given. You, you just never know if you're going to do something weird and suddenly you're going to lose control or get wobbly. Okay, so... One of the things I really want to focus on is deployment. Um, when, when you're jumping a sky surf, the smaller board, you would deploy in a face to earth position with it like that, catching air, driving you forward. So you've really got to think about how you pitch your feet and how you work the board. As soon as you get to this board, the mid-sized board, you're, you're deploying that stood on, stood on it. And it may not look too much, but I promise you, if you strap a propeller to your feet and get out of an aircraft, it's going to spin. It takes some control, so you've got to be really nice and neutral 
and make a really clean deployment and you'll see that. When you get to the big board it's more essential because it will it will affect the canopy. Uh, somebody had a velocity said to me, can I come jump with you? I was like, great, but you can borrow one of my canopies because that's never going to open well. So what I really like about this, this is the pack at Hinton. Hinton <laughs> have been so progressive. What you'll see here, just pause it, they've given me loads of space. Some of the guys on the aircraft have never seen a sky surf before, but they gave me loads and loads of space to gear up. He's pushed himself aside, they've pushed back. The people that have been there before just don't care. Um, but it's a small door, it's a hard exit. You get the board just over the edge of the aircraft, so you've got a really nice exit and you're out. This is the kind of onboard. So stall, stall front loop into a helicopter, drop to a hang. So inverted spinning, nice and steady. <laughs> so, so this is steady, this is steady, we're okay here. Okay, you come out of it, snap the foot, back it upright, yeah. So back loop, back loop, full twist, barrel rolls now. Okay, another stall there. So you bring the board up and stall the board and it kicks over. There we go, barrel roll, barrel roll, full twist. Always checking altitude awareness, always looking at the horizon as well. Clearing the airspace, making sure everything's okay. Nice, steady, clean deployment. And straight up, just to get control over the canopy and then you're always checking to clear airspace. Just like a normal skydive, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Sean is awesome. He gets a bit further over. This is a real classic Rob Harris deployment, really far over, clearing so that the, the, the bag comes out nice and steady. Look at that, straight up. He's keeping his head still. He's not looking for the canopy. He's staying really neutral on the boards to stop that input. Okay, um, <coughs> landing. Landing's always good. So just the thing about landing. With sky surfing, it's the only thing people really see on the ground that they think looks cool. So you've got to make it look cool, <laughs> otherwise they just think you suck. So it doesn't matter what happened in the air. Um, there's a number of ways of landing with the board. As long as you get it off your feet at some point. So you can kick it off if you've just won the X Games, like Stefan. This is just a real classic, that's how I like to come in, just really nice and steady, just let it off. Oliver drops glitter above the crowd and then swoops <laughs> in sideways. It's brilliant. He is a real showman. Um, okay, so I'm going to slow this down here. It's three seconds. Hands will be off the toggles for three seconds. So I've cleared my airspace. One, down to my cutaway. My cutaway is always at the same point and it's muscle memory. I'm looking down to make sure that the actual bindings have released because there's nothing worse than finding that they're not when you're trying to kick it off and it slaps you in the bum. And then two, three, straight, straight back again. So you, and I'm now looking back at, at, at where I am. I do that 1500 feet purposely in a nice clear space in case it ever drops off your feet. It's never happened, but it could. So I'm not over cars, people, anything like that. And then what I'm doing is I'm looking for my, my downwind base final. So I'm, I've wor already worked out because I made early decisions where I'm going to be in the landing pattern. That's a wiggle just to get it off the end of my toes so it's ready. Okay, now I'm holding position and I'm going to come back in. It's a 135 canopy, it's for sale if anybody wants it. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a new canopy. So, so this is so this is the old uh, stiletto. It still works. It's as it's as old as as Jesus, but it's great. I love it. Okay, um, Pro Tour and X Games. We had a competitive series um, in Skydive, and we all love competition, right? And um, it makes us all better because when you go to competitions, <coughs> everybody learns, everybody passes on information. That's always the hope. And what happened with Skysurf is it came through at the same time as Freefly was evolving. So in the aircraft, um, we actually were, were really blessed to have people that were willing to share information all the time. And because we were sharing information, we could then bring that information back to our own countries and help people be safer in their own country. It also gave us the opportunity to get out there, find commercial sponsors to fund this endless summer that we were always trying to follow and go and do projects really, really well and fund them well so that we didn't end up hurting ourselves because of lack of funding. So the Pro Tour was put on by this guy. Greetings from the Oregon coast. 
My name is Pete McKeeman. I've been asked to tell you a little bit about my role in the development of sky surfing over the years. I made my first jump in 1978. I was working as a director cameraman at a TV station in Dallas, Fort Worth, and assigned to go cover a first jump course. I made my first jump at the time, static line of course, and went on to continue in the sport. In 1990, I produced the first freestyle skydiving uh, ESPN show, uh, developed the competition format that combined the camera flyer and the freestyles together as a team and, and scored them for their overall creativity. That format uh, was successful. We continued in 1993 with the first sky surfing world championships at Empuria Brava. Uh, by 1994, the ESPN guys were kicking around the idea of an extreme games event. They came to our event in Eloy and invited us to participate in the first extreme games in 1995. That event was held in Newport, Rhode Island. We had 10 teams plus an alternate and the total purse, cash purse for sky surfing was $20,000. After that, uh, 1996, ESPN asked me to organize the Pro Tour. I did the organized the first SSI Pro Tour in 1996. We had four stops in Europe and North America uh, to qualify athletes for the annual X Games. Uh, 1997, we had four more pro, pro Tour stops to qualify for the X Games in Oceanside, California. Um, overall, we had six X Games events and 14 SSI Pro Tour events uh, over the six years. We awarded $392,000 to sky surfing teams over that period of time, sky surfing and free flying teams. We had added free flying in 96. Um, and overall, there were 170 some countries that saw the, the uh, programs in 21 different languages uh, on the ESPN networks worldwide. Uh, there were over 100 hours of dedicated sky surfing, free flying coverage um, on those networks during that, those six years. 2000 X Games was the last year of sky surfing. Uh, the cash purse was $75,000. Um, and I'm very proud of, of our legacy. Uh, I, if ESPN called and said, hey, let's do it again, I, I would wouldn't think about it in a, over a second. But. Okay, so Pete McKeeman, um, I can't say enough good things about this guy. He is single-handedly responsible for bringing most of the younger generation into the sport through the publicity that he gave the sport through his production. And um, there wasn't a series, so he created one. And he created the freestyle, the free flight, and the sky surf competitions. He brought it to so many people, but he also launched and helped people come through the sport and create careers. And his passion <laughs> still remains, and you can see that even now. And we stay in touch. We, a lot of the, the, the teams stay in touch, and they, they, they hold Pete fondly. And I, I made a whole list of things I would tell you about him, but I can summarize it in a few things. That most people were humbled by the experience of actually being part of his tour. Um, Patrick used to stand there and he was really quiet. Eric for a day, you wouldn't get two words out of Eric. Uh, you'd sit next to him at breakfast and you, you, you wouldn't talk. Um, when you did get him to talk, you'd say to him, you know, what's your idea of a good year? And he'd be like, oh, 1,200 jumps, I'll do like 500 surf and 200 of this and 100 of that and 50 base. And you're kind of going, I live in the UK, um, it rains all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we were trying to compete against him. And he was a, he's a fierce competitor, ferocious competitor. They were all at the top of their game before they started sky surfing. And um, the aircraft was like a locker room in the sky full of people. And so you'd have camera crews like right in your face, just as you're at the exit point. And there would be one back there and you would all be on oxygen and um, it was all being beamed live down. So they were doing interviews in the aircraft as you're actually on the tailgate ready to go. And you're all trying to have fun and enjoy yourselves and everybody's chatting around the aircraft. And it was a great vibe. It was a really good vibe, and it's something really fondly remembered by most people. There was two distinct groups of people, uh, professional and semi-professional. And none of this would have happened without the cameramen. The cameramen were 50% of the total score, so they had to be better than the sky surfer because they had to avoid us when we were spinning around the sky. They had to frame us, do speed changes. 
this is a little bit about the filming. So my partner was 40. Um, everybody knows 40. Um, we we had to live and we had to live together, travel together. Um, we had to think as one, really. It was really good fun because we, we had to think for each other and in the sky, key the next point, know what was going to happen. Really proud to, to represent the UK. Uh, went to the first World Air Games. You know you're onto something when they mint coins with the Sky Surfer on it. Um, working together that close, you produce epic visuals. And this is something I'm, I'm really proud of. Second round jump coming up now for England's pair. Mike Frost and Andy Ford frost the Sky Surfer for the Camera Flyer. Currently in sixth place. Robin, this is a partnership that began in 1996 when Ford, bored with filming traditional skydiving competitions, met Frost, who needed a camera flyer. A lot of times, that's how it begins. In two years, they have really smoothed out their style. They've become much more consistent. They've added a lot more difficulty. And here's a tiny bowl in the hole and a clean version of it. Andy Ford staying very close as he carves around Mike Frost. Mike Frost laying it back in a sit spin to the body rolling triple. Clean carve out to his feet. This is very good work for this team. These are front one and a half twists. They're one of the only teams that can pull it off. And there is a synchronized barrel roll with that front one and a half twist. Lay it back. That's a back scratcher grab on that hen house surprise. There's a new twist on the hen house, reaching over the back of the board to grab the tail. The board, their second round jump, outstanding, 89.4. Their two round average, 87.2. They're in sixth place. Okay, so 89.4, if we'd maintain that score throughout the meet, would put us in third place uh, for the podium. The difference between the teams was really marginal, really, really slim. If you stalled an exit, it would, um, you, you're done, you're done. It was a subjective scoring initially, and people had issue with the judging because the judging's, uh, <coughs> judges, is, they always are in for a hard time because um, they, they weren't participating in doing it. But later on in the tour series, the former X Games champions became the judges, which gave it real credibility. But um, Dave Briggs, who you're going to hear from in a second, is a competitor. He put it really, really well. Um, the, the difference is that everybody could achieve world champion status. It's just about the consistency. And so the people that were doing it all day, every day, were able just to have that little bit edge on, on us that were traveling and, and going. Hey guys, my name's Fordy. And I used to be Mike Frost's camera flyer when we were team PlayStation sky surfing team representing the UK. So what made sky surfing the challenge uh, to film that it was, was the, the incredible speed differences. Uh, when the board's laid out and, and spinning, it, it decelerates, it gets that lift. Uh, and I'd be using all the wings that I had to decelerate with it, maybe stay above it, or maybe let it go up past me. Um, but then when Mike flipped to a more head down, uh, board straight axis, so he was kind of in this axis, it would just fall out the sky and uh, I had no choice but to learn on the fly to be head down. Whilst falling next to someone who was learning to do the moves that he was learning to do uh, with this spinning piece of uh, carbon fibre on his feet, um, I think there was only one, one instance where we made contact and uh, I, yeah, it was, uh, it was fairly painful and something I didn't wish to repeat. I think we got away with it. Uh, I think a lot of times we got away with it uh, with quite a close margin of error. But, you know, that's what, that's what was part of the challenge. That's what made it fun, was, uh, was just pushing the boundaries and limitations of both our skill sets. Okay, so Fordy was a brilliant brilliant uh, teammate and competitor he would get up in the morning and he'd be like let's skip breakfast let's go to the drop zone and i would always have breakfast so at the end of the day he managed to crank out 22 jumps in the day and he was steaming it i i was done at 18 because i'd spun so hard and the rest of the jumps he's like right see ya, i'm off with the flyboys now i'm going to learn how to free fly and it was brilliant he was at, he was in his element he still is um, he's still cranking out jumps even now so what we're going to hear from now is Dave Briggs. And I asked Dave to do this because Dave's style reminds me so closely of Rob Harris and a cross between that and, um, 
and, and just a, a fierce competitor called Bob Griner who also won the X Games. So what you see with Dave is that he's a weekend warrior, just like we were in some ways, but he's very committed and dedicated. He's out there cross trading. And to be a sky surfer, you've got to really commit to the sport. And what's really nice about this is that he's sharing with us some of his, his thoughts of competing. Hi everyone, I'm Dave Briggs. I was the 1998, 99, and 2000 US Sky Surfing Champion. I was also in the X Games those years, 98 through 2000, as well as the US team for 1999 in Australia, where I competed at the World Championships and ended up in sixth place there. So when Sky Surfing came around and I saw it, I said, that's for me. I could put a board on my feet, did a lot of training with Bob Greiner, a former X Games champion. And we accelerated pretty quickly, uh, qualified for the X Games in just 200 uh, jumps with 200 board jumps. My two greatest memories would first be getting the email from Pete McKeeman. I was at my apartment in Edison, New Jersey and walked in with my wife and checked my email and getting that email inviting me to the X Games was just a great day. It was very exciting, it was always a dream and I couldn't believe that I was going. The second most memorable thing was at the 98 X Games. This was over Oceanside, California, the very first jump. I'm on the plane, I'm next to Tanya Garcia O'Brien, and we're looking out the door knowing we're about to jump over the Pacific in front of an international live audience on ESPN. And she just looks at me and she says, why do we do this to ourselves? And uh, that was exactly the perfect summation of how I felt as well. Okay. So, I like his style, he's really strong with his feet, um, you may not have picked that up, but he stands on the board and he's solid on the board and he plants and he muscles the board with his feet, and he was a really, really great competitor, we were like that through, through the meets, and sometimes he'd beat us, sometimes we'd just nudge him out. Um, the next thing I wanted to really do is, is show you the story that progressed with Troy and Vic. And this was a great story. This was a proper all-American story. And they were sponsored by Paris Valley. They were out there and they were crushing it to the world. They were inventing new moves. And they won the X Games. Finally, victory at the X Games. How does it feel, Troy, to have finally have the gold? This is, without a doubt, the best day of my life. I don't think I could top it. I, I, am, on, I am in the clouds right now. This is been so much work and you know we've won a lot of golds in the past and you know but to do it at this event this it's just awesome I, I'm so stoked <laughs> I can't even I don't have words for it Vic where are you going from here oh I couldn't tell you I really couldn't tell you you know we've taken so long to get to this point it, it's you know it seems like we should just continue on go for it you know it, why why ruin a good thing we got this chemistry that works he's he's the best guy surfer in the world you know and that's, that's all I can say. Hard to believe. <laughs> On a day made in heaven, Troy Hartman and Vic Papadano rule the sky. They ride the ultimate wave to the first X Games championship, and the feeling is golden. Okay, so just a little bit about moves. As with any sport, you've got to feel engaged with it, to understand it, to know that you want to have a crack at it. Otherwise, it just looks like it's out of control madness. Um, there was no <laughs> distinction between gender in, in, the, uh, in the Sky Surf uh, SSI Pro Tour and X Games. So we were competing against Vivian. Vivian beat me every single time. Every single time. She is fantastic. She is, she was a professional skydiver, really well sponsored, but really, really talented and very, very strong as well. And technically, she could use her long limbs and she could make the moves like the avalanche, which you'll see in a short while one of the best at doing it, really fast on the helicopters and really technical as well. So what we've got here, just straight out the aircraft, backtracking into a hen house, inverted turning off the hill, really, tr really tricky. Variation on that into a helicopter, showing some style there. This Valeri, Valeri was one of the fastest, I think Oliver was probably the fastest in, in, in the helicopter. We all had fast helicopters. Um, my head came out of the helicopter once and I burst an eye. Um, it's, it, it, it happens. Uh, people tape their arms. We always used to have to tape our arms. This is the avalanche. Oliver just nails this every single time. Um, Eric 
Um, there's not much to say about him. He's, he's just ace. He's just ace. Um, this is the scorpion. And it, it, you'd think it looks out of control, but it's all perfectly in control. But it gets away from you sometimes. You know where you are spatially, and then you can control it. The cameraman's got to work hard. So this is recent. This is just a stall front loop, just to show it you. Back loop, back loop, half twist, stall front loop, stall front loop. Just really simple training moves, just be working on headings. Drop to the hang. That's a really tricky move. Um, row gain. It's a crouching spin, really hard and fast. And you can transition all these moves from one into another. So this is a tail grab sit spin into a laid out, into a body roll triple where you go one axis, one rotation, three rotations on the other axis. Straight over and it's uh, um, into a helicopter. And then just pop out the helicopter. It's, it's, it's easy to trade. The helicopter come out of it, it's just that. Um, the teams. The teams became more commercially aware. And this is really important for everybody in the room if you're looking to get endorsement and sponsorships. It doesn't matter what your discipline is. Patrick was fantastic. He was, he was the person that everybody looked to in the sport. And everybody then fed off him. But what Pete McKeeman did from the Pro Tour, he gave us a pack. And he was like, this is what we're going to give you. You can literally copy and paste that to sponsors. And that will then be a good template for you to use. We were very fortunate. We had Charles Ross on our side. He was, a, he was a British skydiver. He helped me write the proposals. He got us out there. But we built relationships with people. And that's what this is all about. So as you look around the aircraft, Patrick had Sector as a sponsor. Fantastic sponsor. Still sponsoring people now. Yahoo. They keep, they keep the party going. You know, these guys get real value from this because it's good airtime, good branding on the boards. Sky Service went over into film and TV work as well. Necessary. What I really like about this, Tim Porter and Oliver Furrer, the aircraft matches the board. It's brilliant. I love the paint job. It's the biggest cost is the skydiving, for sure. For us, for us, our story um, started with a sponsor. We got on really well with the sponsor. He was having a beer with um, somebody else that was co-funding an event, PlayStation. And he went, you've got to speak to this guy. So I was doing um, a shoot with 4D in Florida at the time. I got a phone call because there was no mobile, so it was on the pay phone. And it was like, uh, you've been picked up from the airport, you've been taken to a meeting, and the rest went from there. I've got the managing director of Sony Europe, and um, he's a good friend of mine, Ray. So he's on the call right now, so we're going to dial into him. And we're just going to get a bit of advice and wisdom from him. So he's left that role a couple of years ago, so he can talk to us. But it's really important that you get some feedback and some advice from him in case you're going down to sponsors yourselves. Hey Ray. Hi, how are you doing? Oh, all right, say hello to everybody. Hi there. <laughs> so this is Ray, everybody. <laughs> so, Ray, thanks for, for joining everybody. Um, just really wanting to talk to you about our time together. You were our title sponsor, and you made things happen for us. Um, the question, I, I asked him this the, for the first time ever earlier today. Why did you choose us? <laughs> well, uh, don't forget this was the early days of uh, PlayStation. Um, 
and uh, we were competing with um, Sega and Nintendo. Um, and uh, our, our point of difference was that we were going for an older crowd um, and we were using technology which was um, a little bit more grown up. So we needed to make, make sure that there was um, you know, associations with people who were uh, doing some cutting edge um, stuff. Um, and um, you know, it, it's uh, with, with video games. Obviously, you can experience just about everything from golf to you name it. Um, one of the things that you can't experience is uh, what you guys do. Um, and of course, for us, it was fantastic because it w was everything. It was about precision. It was about um, artistry in the air. Um, it was about doing things which are, you know. <laughs> To be quite honest, quite dangerous, um, and uh, and you can you can you can appreciate the art of it um, in the safety of your own home. So for us, it was um, it was a no-brainer really. Um, it took it from the 14-year-old um, Nintendo um, Sega crowd and put it into the into the you know the, the, the teens as we were trying to get people to accept um, a bit more technology and also at a at, a, at, a, at that kind of price. So um, yeah, it it just kind of worked for us. I think I think that's incredible because Ray used to get or his office and team they got two hundred proposals a day, and they had a bin in the middle of the office for the rejections, and they kept one, and and it was ours. So it's possible. It really is possible if you find the right people. Ray, second question: What tip would you give to everybody in the room today who are looking to go out to sponsors? Uh, okay, it, basically it's do your homework. Um, you know, not everyone's going to step up to the plate and you have to find that, that area that you think you can link the experience to, um, to, to the company. So in other words, if the company um, is doing something where it's high octane, adrenaline, adrenalism, uh, and, and, and all that kind of area, that, that's great. But have a look at the values of the company, sir. So the company is um, a company that goes out on a limb and, and tries new things, then that's great, that's the right kind of a association. Um, but the, the, the worst thing that you can do is go in there and saying these are our values, which are preparation, um, safety, um, artistry, and all of those things, and then put it into a, a company that doesn't have any of those values. Yeah. They're going to say no, and you might, and you've just wasted your time. So try and find people that um, would uphold the values that, that you do within the, the sport that you're, that, that you're doing. Thank you. And final question, because I've taken you away from your weekends. Social media did not exist and microfeeds when we were doing this. If it had a done, we may well have smashed it. Um, what advice, Ray, would you give people of the advantage this has? Uh, well, now with um, you know with GoPros and, and and all sorts of camera devices on just about everything, you know, this, this today if we're just using um, you know a box standard you know phone to, to do this, and you can get high def everywhere. Um, it, it's, it's a visual art, and don't forget, most of the people are sitting on the ground, <laughs> yeah. and just so you come come back floating down. It, it's it's about what is recorded um, and and how you put that together and then the edit then obviously needs to be then um, tied back with the brand as well so yeah it is about having the markings on the, on, the, on, the, on the right place it is about how you act outside of the the, uh, the activity in the air as well um, so you can you can use all of these things to spread the message across uh, all social media um, and um, and hopefully that will help you get some uh, some dosh to keep doing it. Thank you. Ray, love you loads. I'll speak to you later, yeah? Okay. Be good. Thanks for everything. Thanks a million. Well, say bye, everybody. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Bye, mate. One of the coolest guys you'll ever meet, bar none. Um, we, we needed to prep for a, a job after we finished the sky surfing, um, which was wingsuiting down the Eiger. So we needed a helicopter to train out of in the UK. So we rented a helicopter, flew it to uh, the airfield by his house, loaded him in it and his family, flew him to the airfield, 
had the airfield to ourselves for a day, prepped it, flew it all day, tandemed him, put the second handles on him. Um, he jumped all day next to us whilst we were training out the helicopter. At the end of the day, put the doors and the seats back in, flew home. It was brilliant. He, he's such a cool guy, he loves it. And we did a shot together with me surfing next to him back in the day. And we recreated it with his daughter recently. And it was just a really, really nice thing. And we always say it's nice to be nice. If you're nice to people, they're nice back. You know, he's just a normal guy doing the job. It's just that his job's pretty insane. And he took PlayStation through PS1, 2, and 3, and up to 4. So, you know, this, this guy is serious. Um, we did other projects. So that shot I was doing in Florida with 40 that day, we sent it to Loaded Magazine, we were doing it for them, and they, they published it. And somebody sat on the plane going back to America, it was Ralph Lauren, and they said, um, we like that picture, can we buy it? They went all around the world, checked everybody's other photo stock, looked to reshoot the picture, but came back to this picture, rebranded it, designed a perfume fragrance, and went global with it. And it was kind of weird, because you'd walk into a store like a Selfridges, and there would be a display that's like, 50 foot long, and they're selling the perfume, and you know, that's the kind of appeal that sky surfing was having at that time. It stalled, the sport, the sport stalled, and there's lots of suggestions as to why it stalled. Um, I think if you look at the guys in the tunnels now, if you watch them flying in the tunnels and they're just absolutely shredding, you think, I, cannot, I can't get to that. If I put 50 grand into it, I still wouldn't touch them. And the, the sport of sky surfing got a little bit like that. It got really niche at the top and there was very little separating everybody. And, and for us, we were getting really burnt out really fast and it was just hurting us. The body was really hurting and, um, and, and Troy puts it really well now in his summation of it. Um. Sky surfing, it never became, uh, you know, hugely popular just because it was, it was so hard. It was so difficult and so frightening uh, in the beginning. You know, you're, you're, you're looking at hundreds of jumps of trying to uh, get through that learning curve where you're scared the whole time. Uh, you look at wingsuiting or free flying or some of these other disciplines. Well, wingsuiting in particular, it's frightening uh, for, for sure. It's frightening in the beginning, but it you know, I'd say after 30 jumps with a wingsuit, or, or less really, but you're starting to feel comfortable in those 10, 20 first, you know, first jumps with a wingsuit, you're starting to feel comfortable. Uh, that doesn't happen with a board. It, it takes three, 400 jumps uh, before you start getting to that point. So that's the reason why most people um, didn't, didn't, you know, take on sky surfing. It was just a big commitment in that way. And you couldn't, you couldn't take time off. You had to literally be you know, I was doing at least, uh, you know, I was doing 100 jumps a month probably, but, you know, never less than 50 jumps a month. Uh, I had to be jumping constantly to, you know, not go on current and become unsafe. Uh, and that's hard, you know, you have to have that sort of commitment to it. Okay, so I totally agree with him. It was really hard. But we're in an era that's evolving now. There's a generation and, um, and we, we were looking forward from that as a team. And I got together with this guy. So Fordy was learning his free fly, and we we're all starting to hear about um, wingsuits. Patrick had moved on into, into wingsuits by this point. And, um, and then when Patrick died, I, I started jumping with, with, with Adrian. And we started looking at what was possible for the future of Sky Surf through 99 and into 2000. And we were, we were trying to find where is the next step for sky surfing because everybody was spinning really hard and it was a question of can you spin as hard as your arms pump with blood and blow up? And we were taping our arms up with ace bandages all the way up to here and uh, Sean who invented the Invisible Man was paralyzed for days afterwards and um, it would take him a couple of weeks to get feeling back in his hands properly after a competition. And that was just not sustainable. So we were looking at other things. We were looking at mounting the camera upside down. So his camera's upside down. So we were taking our exits in different ways. And this was a trip that we did around Florida. We were taking out linked exits and really no tension at all. This was only our third jump, no tension. I've never jumped with him before. 
there's no, no surprise he was the best, one of the best free flyers in the world. Look at this, he got me out of the, the formal jumpsuit and into a t-shirt and a pair of jeans, baggy top. Uh, he wanted me to go without shoes. Um, I thought that was a step too far, personally, but, um, but we had a lot of fun going super fast, seeing how fast we could go. And we were trying to do new routines of tracking across the sky and orbiting. And we wanted to get more interaction with the board, which then would then drive this, the um, subjective scoring with the judges. And this was all working great, and we were flying around. We had Philippe Valour join us, um, one of the founders of Sky Surfing. Didn't even tell me he sky surfed. You know, that's how quiet they are. Um, but this was flying around. We, he was trying to fly around me as fast as I could orbit. Um, it was it was just really interesting. We were trying to get new angles. <laughs> it didn't all work. <laughs> this we were trying to loop with him holding onto the board like a POV. Uh, and this is a great. This was just a sunset chilled out dive. So, just spinning nice and gently. He's now doing full head down, 160 miles an hour. Altitude awareness is important, so you've always got to check your altimeter. Um, you're looking at the horizon as well because it blurs and so you get a nice visual on the horizon so you know when that's coming up and we had a great time we had an absolutely superb time doing that and it was good to explore sadly the sport was stalling at this point and the last x games were coming up and um and i had a huge accident at that point and um had to have some time off so where are we at uh the future this next generation is coming through and they, they're really bad. They're really, really good. And they're just so, so good at what they're doing right now in the tunnels. And the base levels increase now on people free flying. Those moves I was just doing with, with, with Adrian, I jumped with an awesome, awesome uh, tracker recently. And there was a group of them and they're all over me like a rash. So that level is instantly there. And I, I, just, I just love watching how people are coming through and what they're doing. So there's a lot of crossover in board sports, like skateboarding dipped and then came back up. Sky surfing may dip and then come back up a little bit. It's never going to be at the level it was at before. Don't believe that uh, media works in the same way that it did. But we know that the people are there and there will be an interest. So we just need to show that it can be done safely. I've been standing sideways since 1992. I might be older, but friendships endure. And this means the world to me that um, we're still here, we're still friends, we're still smiling after everything that we went through. So that's it. Thank you very much.